about ASEM Lifelong Learning Cooperation Objectives, Achievements, and Future Prospects by Mr. Arne Carson, Chairman of the ASEM Lifelong Learning Hub. And the future prospects of the cooperation and lifelong learning Asia and Europe. So far since the start in 2002, we have been defining them as trying to establish a network of leading universities and research institutes in all of the ASEM partner countries that can stimulate production of new knowledge and can also carry out exchange of experiences in the field of lifelong learning between the two regions. In the beginning, we asked the ministries of education to point to the leading university in their country that had a research group or team, or institute or center in research in lifelong learning, and we made a network out of them. One of the, another objective has been to establish this university network that can initiate lateral, bilateral, multilateral comparative research projects in the field of LLL. And uh, why is it that we are doing this? Well, we want to promote mutual understanding between Asia and Europe, but we also want to raise the quality of the work of our researchers. And we are convinced that by working together, you can raise the quality of the work. International cooperation in research projects, research networks, is now generally seen as a means of raising quality. We are trying to combine this with also raising the relevance of research projects. We think that by relating to ministries, to uh, education reform, we can better secure the relevance of our research projects. So in fact, the idea is that we involve researchers from leading universities who have research in the field of lifelong learning in order to raise the quality and the relevance of the research. And the last objective has been also to use this network as an umbrella for exchanging students and faculty or academics. We have had a wish to establish the uh, advisory board as a uh, mechanism to secure an open meeting between research and politics, an open meeting of political and institutional stakeholders working with LLL. So the work of the ASEM Lifelong Learning Hub could become an important source for sustainable human resource development and for policy recommendations concerning competence development and effective strategies for implementing lifelong learning in the countries. And the last objective has been also to inform the public to communicate comparative research results and good practices in Asia and Europe. In, in fact, we have been quite ambitious, I should say, trying to raise quality and relevance of research, trying to insist on evidence-based educational research, trying to involve policymakers in a dialogue in order to secure 
development of educational reform that will be researched, informed, that will be based also on evidence from research, from knowledge about more or less what we know works in education. What are the achievements? So far, I think we have seen more committed and competent researchers. We have, uh, over the last two, three years especially, seen involvement and in more Asian and European member universities in our Council of University Management Representatives. I mentioned before the break that we have an organizational structure based on an advisory board of ministry representatives, a council of university management representatives, and researchers who are doing the work in the five research networks. And we have seen that more and more universities over the last two to three years are interested in joining the Council of University Management Representatives and also in sending, nominating researchers to participate in the research networks. We have also seen more and more countries at the ministerial level involving in the advisory board. And uh, I think the highlight was the uh, Hanoi Ministerial Meeting on Education in May 2009, where not only lifelong learning became very high on the political agenda, but also where the lifelong learning hub presented an activity plan which was endorsed by the ASEM countries. And the establishment of a small secretariat has also made it possible to support quality comparative research projects with administrative service to publish the results of the joint research projects and also to take the policy recommendations to the political level. I have tried to list here the thematic recommendations that have come out of the work from 2005 to 2009. Much more has come out, but I have tried here to mention the six most important contributions. And uh, if you have a look at them, you will see that many of them are more or less well known from the uh, political discussions, both at the uh, Simio level in uh, Asia and the uh, ASEAN Council level and also at the EU Commission level. First of all, the first one being applying an integrated approach to lifelong learning which is not easy. This is about integrating all sectors in education into an overarching sector of lifelong learning, including formal, non-formal, and informal learning. Many countries have made national strategies for lifelong learning where this is a priority but it is very difficult to implement in practice. One of the elements is the accreditation of prior learning. Another one is development of evaluation models on lifelong learners' outcome. A second recommendation is about shifting the paradigm from teaching to learning. 
And this again is rather difficult to achieve in practice. This is moving, moving from the focus on qualifications to the focus on competences. In both Asia and Europe, we are very interested in developing national qualification frameworks, also in developing regional qualification frameworks. And the interesting thing is that the only place that you will find the word qualification is in the title of the framework. The term qualification does not exist in all the content of the framework. Here you only speak about competences. So what has happened in reality is that we are moving away from a system that basically focuses on qualifications that are certified or acknowledged by a ministry, moving away to that and moving towards recognition of competences, whether they are recognized by an authority or not. This is a revolution in education. This is about bridging curriculum and didactics. Let me say, we are used to having curricula accepted by ministries. It is very important for all education programs that they are based on a special curriculum that sometimes you think is the core body of this discipline or this subject. You cannot be a sociologist if you have not read some of the main books of a certain number of famous sociologists. We're moving away from this concept towards a situation where we focus on the competences of the person after the studies. The idea is, what have you learned to do? What have you learned? What is it that you can do in practice with what you have learned at the university or in the vocational school and so on? Not so much, what kind of books have you studied? A lot of people have read a lot of books but are not able to use the content or the lessons from these books in practice. Now we're moving to a situation where we say it is much more important what you are capable of doing with what you have learned than what kind of books you have studied, what curriculum you have had. This is also a major shift because it means that the whole work of many ministries in uh, accepting curricula is losing importance towards focusing on what kind of curricula can develop the competences that make people able to do something with what they learn. Over the last 15 years, I think, we have more and more looked at the functional aspect of competences. In the knowledge, society and economy, we have started to say, it is no longer enough to learn to write or to read or to calculate you have also to learn how to use it in practice. It is no longer enough to learn to read if you don't learn how to use in practice what it is you read. This is moving from a passive skill to an interactive competence. This is also a way why we can say we are moving away from skills development 
moving towards competent development. The fourth one is about investing in lifelong learning. We need to develop new cost-effective financial models and quality systems for lifelong learning. And we can see, based on the research, that the way this functions well, it is based on partnership models. It is, it is, it is obvious that efficient financial models builds now on public spending, on spending of the workplace, the employer, and on spending from the individual in training. So it's a tripartite mob model, three, three parties invest. It's a responsibility shared with three parties, the state, the enterprises, and the individual. There are very many different models, but most of the, some of the most efficient ones, they rest on this tripartite model. The fifth one is about removing obstacles and increasing access to lifelong learning. This is very, very important. As I mentioned before the break, many people have had bad school experiences and do not want to return to school. But in fact, a lot of lifelong learning happens at the workplace. So people do not have to return back to school. They can stay in their workplace or they can stay in their family, use distance education methods or e-learning, CD-ROMs, and so on. But obstacles, there are many, many obstacles. Some are psychological. So we need to work on motivating people to want to engage more in continuing education and training. And we need to remove obstacles that can be financial obstacles. It can be uh, transportation obstacles if there is no transport to the place where the, you will find the learning environment and if you are not interested in distance education methodology. So we need to strengthen motivations and incentives. And the last one is uh, about institutional change. We need to develop learning environments that will focus on developing the interactive competences, formal, non-formal, and informal learning. And this is a huge challenge for many institutions that they shall not no longer mainly focus on a curriculum, but have to focus on the learning outcome. How can we do it? How can we teach so that our students, our pupils, or the participants will develop interactive competences so that we'll be able to do something in practice with what they have learned and not only to be able to repeat, to tell about what they have learned without being able to do it in practice. And this is about very much about e-learning and workplace learning to instigate institutional change so that you involve e-learning and workplace learning. I have come to future prospects. How can we envisage the uh, future of cooperation between Asia and Europe in the field of lifelong learning policies, in the field of lifelong learning research, and uh, hopefully later on? How can we also involve practitioners and uh, the world of work, of business enterprises. Well, we have a few uh, suggestions. We would like to strengthen the uh, structure that we already have. Involve more universities at the management level, but also at the researchers level. 
and involve more ministries in the advisory board. And uh, one of the objectives, as I mentioned, of this meeting here today, in fact, this will be tomorrow, will be uh, an informal meeting for ministerial representatives about the advisory board uh, with the aim of expanding the advisory board. One uh, of the aims is also to look for voluntary contributions from the ministries in the 43 ASEM member countries plus the ASEAN Secretariat and the EU Commission in order to support the research that is going on. Another future prospect is to provide countries with more opportunities to develop and pursue their lifelong learning policy priorities. We would like to put the policy recommendations from our research networks at work or to work, making it useful for ministries and for educational practice. We would also like to take some new initiatives so that we will include all ASEAN partner countries. I think that today we are 38 universities from 24 countries and uh, I hope that by the end of next year we will be researchers from all 43 or more than 40 ASEM countries and uh, also have included the EU Commission and the uh, ASEAN Council. Uh, a fourth one is of course to secure a sustainable organization and structure in order to support the development, the platform, the dialogue between research and policy, and uh, increasing the visibility of the work being done through various communication channels. You will find at the back of this room an exhibition telling a bit about the story of the ASEM Lifelong Learning Hub, but you'll also find a table with books, publications, and you are very welcome to look at them. It's very important that we publish the result of our comparative research. You're also very welcome to take the brochures uh, uh, in the back, first of all, about the ASEM Lifelong Learning Hub, but also about the European Erasmus Mundus elite program in lifelong learning. And uh, I'm happy to see that there are two of the students, of former students from that program present here in the room today. Finally, I'd like to say that uh, next year, in November 2010, we plan to organize a major event in Austria or Germany, we are still negotiating it, with uh, a conference with between 500 to 2,000 participants where we would like to showcase the successful ASEM cooperation in lifelong learning to the world. And uh, we are establishing panels in that conference of ministers and uh, social partners and leaders from industry to discuss the policy recommendations coming from our five research networks. And uh, this uh, major competence, in fact, should, I hope, successfully involve in our work also the world of work, the enterprises, industry, service industry, and so on. Let me end here by uh, giving you the website of the cooperation project, www.dpu.dk.asm. We are trying to update regularly our website so that you will have the latest information of the cooperation, and we are sending out now e-news letters with recent information about activities 
And I hope that in two weeks' time from now, you'll also be able to find the e-newsletter documenting this conference here in Bangkok in July 2009. Thank you very much.